name is Madeline Seiko, and I'm your host today on Beyond the Couch. Beyond the Couch is a periodic program brought to you by the Psychoanalytic Center of Philadelphia. In each episode, one of our members will talk about a current topic through a psychoanalytic lens. Today's guest is Dr. Ira Brenner. Dr. Brenner is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and a training and supervising analyst at the Psychoanalytic Center of Philadelphia. With a special interest in the area of psychological trauma, Dr. Brenner lectures internationally, has authored over 90 publications, and maintains an all-age private practice in Ballack-Kinwood, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Dr. Brenner. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you today? Good, good. So, as many of you know, there have been several major news events over the past few years highlighting sexual abuse of youth by authority figures such as members of the clergy, sports coaches, and even teachers and child care workers. While many people might reasonably recognize that a person who is sexually abused as a child would experience emotional trauma in their life, it might surprise you to learn that the impact of sexual abuse can be felt generations later. Understanding and treating intergenerational trauma and transmission of, of trauma is a specialty of Dr. Brenner. So Dr. Brenner, can you explain what intergenerational transmission of trauma is and what that means to people and how they would even recognize it? The idea of transmitting horrible experiences from one generation to the next is really the essence of the notion of intergenerational transmission of trauma. It was first recognized in children of Holocaust survivors, okay. and it has been, this model has been applied to offspring of survivors of other horrendous large social events, okay. such as uh, other wars, uh, children of prisoners of war, torture victims, uh, children who, uh, whose parents were interned in some of the uh, Japanese POW camps uh, in this country during World War II. Okay. It's a phenomenon uh, that has been now recognized. The, um, the, the, the question is how does one recognize this? How does one see this? I, right. I, I think this is really what, uh, uh, what you're asking. Yes, me. exactly. Yeah. And this, because of the huge variability of the trauma experience of the parent, him or herself, and by definition, the trauma itself has to have ended before the birth of the child so that the child, the offspring, him or herself, is not a direct right. uh, uh, survivor of, of the trauma. It has to be known. It has to be known that that parent has experienced something. Otherwise, it can get missed. Would, so, the, would the parent actually verbalize this to the child, or would it, is it something that you would have to pick up through the therapeutic process? Unless a clinician is really, really sharp and is very well versed in the history of what the parent may have experienced, it is very likely to be missed. And so often, as we know with trauma survivors of all kinds, there is so much shame and irrational guilt associated with it, and sometimes major disturbances of memory that uh, people don't talk about these events. They may repeat it unconsciously in their behavior, in their child-rearing practices, and it may show mm -hmm. itself in an echo, shadow kind of way in I their see. children. But if this history isn't known by the therapist, it is very easily missed. And if that's the case, it is a major reason for failures and uh, uh, refractory treatments because this crucial bit of history is not known. Right. Very interesting. So how, what kind of behaviors, how, what is the impact of sexual abuse trauma as revealed in these stories, such as with the clergy? How does that affect... The, the original person who's actually experienced mm -hmm. the emotional trauma. What, what would you expect to see in that person? Mm -hmm. Well, I think as we have read and heard about in the media a, about these uh, horrendous uh, uh, experiences, the undermining of trust in authority, the uh, 
in many cases, but not all cases, the, the destruction of belief and faith mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is enormous. The impact on self-esteem, confidence, one's own personal sexual development, one's capacity to have relationships. Uh, in fact, um, not infrequently, survivors of severe sexual abuse refuse to even consider having their own children because of their fear that they will visit upon their children what was done to them. Oh, really? so, so some survivors uh, will not even consider having children. Those who do may have uh, uh, unwittingly passed along some of, uh, some of their trauma, some of their survival experiences. And because the trauma experience itself is so variable in the victim, him or herself, on one hand, it's, it's unfair to them to generalize, but on the other hand, if we don't have some guidelines, then we really don't know what we're looking for. So persistent shame, guilt. So would they pass that sense of shame and guilt onto their children? Is that that you would see in a, in a child if a person was sexually abused and then they did have children? Do they feel, encourage their children, uh, even unconsciously, to feel shameful about sexuality? That certainly can happen. And as I think we know from normal human development, there is a brief period of time where shame is a normal accompaniment of the early developmental experience, toilet training and early, uh, early mastery of those parts of the body. Shame and cleanliness and following rules are a natural part of development. When things get intensified and there are problems and, and children get stuck, that could be for a variety of reasons. And more than likely, uh, the possibility that a parent was sexually traumatized would not even be in a therapist's mind because there's so right. many other possibilities. Right. And I think this is one of the reasons why it gets missed and because uh, uh, there, there's such reluctance to talk about it and think about it and implicate the Catholic Church or any other major uh, uh, venerable institution. It, it is so contrary to decent people's sense of fairness to even imagine these things happening. So there's a lot of reasons to not think about it. But they, it, they, they persist and can exert a very dark shadow for a long period of time. So it seems that because there is this intense sense of shame, um, the victims of sexual abuse sort of repress that and don't don't talk about it. Don't they don't report or even when it, when it does happen to them. And um, do you think that they should be forced to report so that they are more, start to get comfortable talking about it? Do you think that that would help later on and not produce such uh, you know this sort of um, almost unconscious transition transmission? Mm -hmm. I think the idea. And I, and I don't think you mean this, of uh, forcing the children to express it, because anything that feels like coercion to a, uh, a victim or the child of a victim is, in a sense, a symbolic repetition of the original trauma, but okay. to encourage them in, okay. a safe, in a safe, comforting way where there is a chance for healing and reconciliation. Okay, that, you know, that makes you, sense. You know, I, I think of the, uh, the, the South African model, the truth and reconciliation, uh, uh, right. large social uh, experiment. Uh, that has yet to happen in this country for anything, right. whether it's been slavery uh, or any of the massive abuses in our venerable institutions that right. is yet to occur. The, 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 one of the um, articles that I read about this, they mentioned that um, trying to encourage or um, people to go to the police so that even if they did report it to somebody who was maybe a parent, mm -hmm. um, but then how to, how to handle that from there. And that many of, because of the shame and also fear of repercussion, um, they did not tell the police. And then that uh, led to further abuses by those individuals of, of other children. So there's some of this then there's this guilt that they didn't report because they didn't say anything. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky area. Right. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting point. I think we heard this argument in the uh, Kavanaugh hearings 
where the, uh, 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 right. the alleged victims were severely criticized for not reporting these right. things early. Uh, and if so, uh, if it were that bad, why didn't they? Well, I think you're bringing up one of the major reasons, the fear, the shame, and the th oftentimes the threats. Mm -hmm. And this has been especially notable in, uh, uh, in, in institutions like the Catholic Church, the threats of torture, death, uh, uh, punishment to family if children were to tell uh, is another huge deterrent. And the other thing to, ta to uh, keep, it, keep in mind that when such trauma is so severe and repetitive and resulting in such helplessness in the child, it results in confusion, disturbances in cognitive development, and a, a question of reality testing. It doesn't mean they become psychotic necessarily, but they doubt themselves very, very easily because the authority, the person who's a, uh, an agent of, of God is saying, right. you better not tell or you will go to hell or this never happened right. or, or you're, something bad will p happen to your parents. The child literally ejects it from his or her consciousness and then this brings up the whole question of repressed memory and the controversies associated with that. But I can tell you categorically from my own clinical experience that it is quite possible, and I've seen it repeatedly, it is quite possible for children who have been severely traumatized in a variety of different ways to literally put it out of their consciousness for years and years and years. And it's not until an event can come up in adulthood that might trigger it. It might be a car accident. It might be it, it might be something in the news about uh, 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 revisiting the uh, the cases of clergy abuse right. uh, last February right. uh, here here in Pennsylvania, where a lot of things started to come to the fore for people. So there can be an external trigger, which then can revive these things. So, so do you think that it would be better for young children to go into, uh, if, if you knew that they had been abused or you suspected it, should they be encouraged to seek a therapist even at an early age to see if there is something going on? I mean, as a parent, I can only imagine if my child started to act strangely or, or I noticed unusual behaviors and, um, and I would be concerned, but if you ask your child and they say there's nothing wrong, again, not cope, not force, but encourage a child to seek out therapy, would that be a helpful tool to, for the parent to see if there is, has been abuse and prevent this? Because I imagine that if you wait years, it's all that much harder to deal with the impact. I totally agree. I, I think a basic principle of uh, working with children is early intervention. And I think when alert parents notice a significant change in a child's behavior, uh, a child's loss of developmental acquisitions, such as a return to bedwetting or, th or okay. things like that, uh, a change in mood, uh, a terrible drop in grades, uh, withdrawal from social activities. And even if the child says nothing is wrong and the parents see that this is a persistent thing. Something very likely has happened. Again, in the absence of, of an undetected medical problem, which could result in psychological right. problems, which has to be considered also. Absolutely. Bringing a child to uh, an expert for diagnostic evaluation, it would be very, very wise. And it doesn't commit the parents to long-term therapy right. or, or anything like that, or even stigmatizing uh, the child, but it's like recognizing an infection before it spreads completely throughout the body. So you had said before that you um, you had done work with um, children of Holocaust survivors, and so so you said there, there's a similarity between the trauma of a sexually abused child and a Holocaust survivor in, in a sense in the, this transmission. Um, experiencing the similar kinds of impacts from the traumas that their parents experienced? What I was saying is that this idea that the parents' trauma can be transmitted to the next generation is something that we can see in a variety of 
populations. Okay. Uh, I think Holocaust trauma, because of the nature of genocidal persecution, because of the fact that the Jews were uh, known to be hated by Hitler and the Nazi ideology, it was no secret that terrible things were in store for them. Okay. The children who innocently and willingly volunteered and became part of uh, uh, a church hierarchy, whether it's an altar boy or uh, uh, altar server, uh, children who willingly go to uh, an institution that is supposed to provide refuge and guidance and counseling and are betrayed is a very, wow. very different kind of <clears throat> soul murder, to, right. to use a, an expression that uh, uh, ha has been uh, invoked when it, when it comes to this kind of trauma. It's a different kind of destruction. And each kind of trauma leaves its own fingerprint. And as a result, the echoes of that fingerprint will be a little bit different. I see. Do you think that, um, particularly in relation to, to clergy, but to many authority figures, that there's a that those are almost like parental figures for those children. So it's almost as though the betrayal is from a parent, or is it completely different from from that? In as much as they are exalted uh, authority figures, very very much. And when it comes to a, a leader in a religious institution, whether it's a Catholic Church or another denomination, um, these leaders are held to a higher standard and they are representing the beliefs of that given religion. And certainly for altar boys who uh, were then groomed and sexually abused by priests, my understanding about the responsibility of the altar boys is that they were to participate in the service and in the service a miracle is supposed to occur each mass. So as part of the indoctrination of their responsibilities and their role, a huge weight was put on their shoulders. And I would imagine that the destruction that it had on their minds and their belief systems and the betrayal uh, that they felt was probably too much for many of them to bear to keep in their consciousness. So I think that contributed to a lot of the forgetting for many, many years because it is so uh, incompatible. Right, right. Um, so when people start to speak out, does that help others speak out? I mean, is that a positive for them? Or um, is it is it make it worse because it stirs up feelings that they've repressed? I think you're both right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the power of the group when it comes to advocacy, and shared reality testing, as we were talking about before, this notion of consensual validation that you can understand, you've been through it also, it may have been different, but we kind of know what it's like. There's enormous value in that kind of camaraderie because so often this kind of abuse alienates people and they feel like they're the only ones in the world who have had this happen yeah. to them. So. The, the part of being part of a support group or an advocacy group can be extremely important in the healing process, but at the same time, triggering too. And what about the media coverage? Does that, is that you know, worse? Because a lot of the, the newspapers and the reports then start to interview people, and you wonder, is that, um, is that in their best interest, or is it, is it too much then to suddenly have the spotlight on you and and then people you might not have told anything about this for your entire life, all of a sudden they're looking at you differently. Well, again, I think the, uh, the media is so important in a free society. I think the, the media is so powerful. But I think like all institutions, the media uh, is in the business of perpetuating itself. Right. So it can hurt as much as it can help by bringing things to surface that would be covered up by other institutions. So it's a very powerful and it has to be, uh, children have to be protected. So in general, we, we do feel strongly about children and we, we 
do try and protect them. But yet these organizations, and, I, and I'm not even just picking on the Catholic Church because, you know, there are schools, there are sports programs, um, there was the whole thing with the gymnastics. They, they tend to look the other way. How, how is that? Like what's, is it because they too cannot accept that this was happening from people that they normally would like and have dinner with? Um, why would they not, if somebody came to them and said, you know, I think there's something going on here, why do they not jump on that right away? I think it challenges the basic assumptions of how life is supposed to be. I also think, and, and I would not generalize this at all, but I know of some situations where abusive parents have actually sacrificed their children to other abusers. Uh -huh. And uh, this uh, can result in, in an unspoken collusion or conspiracy. So there would be no reason to talk about it. So would these be parents who had been abused themselves? Very likely. And this goes back to the issue of intergenerational transmission. The original definition of intergenerational transmission pertains to actual families where it's parent to child. But we have seen that institutions can have their own intergenerational wow. transmission, not the biological family, so generations. Generations of leaders, generations of scout leaders, generations of clergymen. And since we know from our study of child abusers that many child abusers were abused children themselves, if we extrapolate, it very well may be that despite the small number of uh, self-reported uh, uh, sexual abuse amongst predator priests, that it's a much higher number. And it may be that uh, those uh, predator priests were victims themselves. So. And their victimizers may have been victims themselves. Wow. And we can only imagine how many generations institutionally right, this may back, go back. back. And if that's so, this would give us a little bit more of an idea of why it is so hard to change institutional right. culture. Right, and to, and to actually put an end to this. Yes. Um, although the statistics seem to indicate that because of, of some of the exposure, there has been a, at least a reduction in the number of reported cases. I don't know if there's an actual reduction mm -hmm. or just a reduction in reported cases. Um, do do the, the public apologies help? Or I mean, if, if, uh, if the abuser comes back and says to the person, I know that I've done you wrong, or if the org institution itself, uh, you know, a, a sporting uh, body of, of leaders comes and says, we know that this abuse is gone, we're sorry, we, we, we should have saw, said something. Does that help the person heal, or is that, uh, again, is it just neutral? Is it just make them angry because it's too late, too little too late? Well, I think if we, uh, again, it's hard to generalize, but if we were to consider the fact that people appreciate apologies, that people appreciate acknowledgement of wrongdoing by others, if it's perceived as a sincere apology and not simply a perfunctory thing to then just put it, uh, put it aside and then go on, if one gets a sense that uh, this is a sincere effort to change things and make things right, then I think it could go a long way towards a healing process, but not completely result in healing. That in and of itself may be necessary, but not sufficient. So do you think that the, um, that there is, that the only way to really heal then is to seek out therapeutic help and, and you know, bring this to the surface? Is that really the best way for people to deal with these kinds of traumas, whether they're the children or the, the individuals who are abused? I don't think there's any substitute for individual, in individual therapy when dealing with a deep-seated problem that has invaded the mind and affected one's development. Uh, it is so rampant uh, and, and the repercussions are so great and the implications for one's future uh, parenthood uh, are very, very important. That in conjunction with some of the other things that we have talked about, support groups, advocacy, public policy changes, uh, and uh, for some people who are so inclined 
to speak and write about these things themselves. I think it's a multi, multi-layered approach to the healing process. And it's a, for many people, it's a lifelong venture. But there, but there is hope for people Absolutely. to move past Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it certainly is a, a very shocking and um, upsetting reality that we are learning more and more about. And it's great to know that there are people like you out there who can help individuals and help them go through the process to heal. This has been um, very interesting learning about this um, and understanding a little bit more about how something like this can affect not just the individual, but their, their children and even their children's children and lead to even you know, perpetuation of the problem in various different ways. So um, I thank you very much for coming and talking to us today and, and sharing some of your thoughts with us. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to learn more, they can always contact the Psychoanalytic Center and ask to speak with, with you, and we can put you in touch. Um, thank you again for, t for visiting with us today, and uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.